Hola, welcome everyone. I'm glad to see people. I'm giving people just a minute to come in and we'll start in a few seconds. There are a couple of things, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So there is a chat today. Uh, if you're interested in uh, a handout and you like that sort of thing and want to follow along, so it sort of roughly follows the slides, I've put that into the chat. Uh, there's also going to be a back channel um, which I won't use a lot today because we're in Zoom, but I am going to talk about uh, that. Um, so yes, please, please introduce yourself and say hello and tell us uh, what part of the world you're from. It's wonderful to see people from all over the world uh, who are interested in, in pedagogy and, and teaching our students. So I am going to, to hop right in as, as people join, but I'm, I'm thrilled to see everybody introduce themselves in the chat. Uh, and again, if you scroll up, the, there's, a, there's a handout if you want it, and there's also uh, this back channel, which you can see on the screen uh, today. Wonderful. So I start with uh, a, a, a study about heart attacks and to make the point that change is hard. So in this, this research, you've had a heart attack and the doctor says to you, I'm very sorry, but you're going to die unless you can change your behavior. You need to do four things if you want to survive. You need to eat a little less salt, drink more fluid. You need to exercise and weigh yourself daily. Four things that individually don't look too hard. But the question is, what percentage of people do you think can do all four? You can dump it in the chat if you want. If you have a percentage you want to give me, what percentage of people in this situation, you've had a heart attack, you're in the hospital, and the doctor says you need to do these things to survive. What percentage of people do you think can change their behavior under these circumstances? Is no one gonna hand, hey, give me a guess? You, could, you can drop it in the chat if you want, just a guess, 22%, a lot, very specific. All right, 50%. Yes, let's have some, okay, some guesses as to what percentage of people can do all four. Well, researchers found that actually only 7% could do all four of these things after a heart attack. Um, what percentage of people could just exercise? You've had a heart attack, the doctor says to exercise, just get off the couch a little bit. Only 48% can change their behavior. But here's the reason I show you this study. What is the largest predictor for change? In, in other words, what determines who will end up in the 7% that can't you know, that can do all four things and will make the change. And what predicts who will end up in the 93% of people who don't make the change? And the answer is loneliness. This was a surprise. This is not what they expected. They thought maybe education will matter or something else. But if you think about it, you've had a heart attack, you're in the hospital. The thing that matters is, well, is my family going to come visit me? Do I have a wedding of grandchildren that I want to go to? Is there something that I need to live for? And if nobody comes to visit you and you're not, you're just not very motivated, it's like, yeah, nobody cares, right? And so it turns out a couple of things we can, we can draw from this. The first is that we need to remind ourselves the brain is not a computer. We don't just input data. You had a heart attack, here's what you have to do, and then you won't have another heart attack, right? That, that makes sense to us because we're teachers. Right, this worked for us, but content is not enough. You don't change people's minds and get them to think in new ways by just giving them content because the brain is not a computer. That's just a metaphor and it's a bad metaphor. It turns out that, right, and our old three R's, at least the, the old American three R's of, of reading, writing, and arithmetic, not really R's, but the, the, the basis of school used to be thought of as content. I need to teach students these things and then they'll be okay in the world. But now we understand that we live in a world where most of what students need, we can't teach them because it hasn't yet been discovered or invented that students are entering a world where there's lots and lots of new things to learn over their life. And we've just seen that just giving people content isn't enough to change your mind and to get you to think in new ways. So if I want people to think in new ways, the first R is relationships, right? Motivation comes from, do these people care about me? Do they want me to change? Do they care about what's in my head? But also resilience. Right? Failure is a part of learning. We need to build in structures for failure into all of our lessons. And then most importantly, reflection. 
if we don't give students the opportunity to reflect on the content we've given them, if we just say here is more and more and more content, we're leaving out the most critical stage, which is that the thinking that we want students to do only happens when we design our pedagogy to include reflection. So the three R's that I would, the new three R's I call them are relationships, resilience, and reflection. And they are the basis of any higher education system. So it's not that content doesn't matter. We still need to provide content, but content is a bit like giving students fish. It's useful in the short term and students like it, right? It's easy, just give me some fish master. But teaching students to fish for themselves is more complicated, it's harder, students don't like it as much. But long-term, it's the best thing to set them up for a world that now change is imminent, right? Most of the jobs that students will have have not yet been invented. We are inventing jobs all the time and they're gonna have to use new information. So we need to set them up for this new learning economy by giving them a little bit more process than we might have done before. So what is our favorite technique for teaching change and for teaching critical thinking, we often call it? Well, we think of discussion, but we have a lot of faith in discussion. Does it really work? In other words, we might ask the question this way, do you think for yourself, is it possible for a group of students in a classroom who are discussing a subject to really be changing and thinking, or in fact, are they just conforming? So one of the early tests in this was done by a psychologist, Solomon Ashe, done at Swarthmore in 1951. Um, and he did what he said was a vision test, right? He brought students into a room and said, I, here is the target line. I'd like you to tell me which of these other lines is closest to the target line. Uh, now I'm assuming that most of you who can, who can see relatively well have very little difficulty identifying C as the, as the line that is closest if it's just a vision test. And in fact, that's what he discovered. But then he changed the conditions. He put people into a, into a group, not unlike we do group discussion. And he said, which line is the target line? But the first three people were really working for him and they would go A. And the second person would say, oh, it's A. And the third, oh, I really think it's A. So the question now is what percentage of people say it's A when they can clearly say it's C, right? We know it's C, but the other people in our class said a, so maybe, I, so what percentage of people go along with this? You can guess again. What percentage of people will go along with the wrong answer because other people in front of them said that? And it turns out, well, we have some cynics. A third of people was, was what happened in this case. Now, of course, interestingly, right, there are ways to make this number go up. One of the ways to make the number go up is to make the lines closer together, right? Create greater ambiguity. And when the lines are really far apart like they are here, it's easy to make the, that number goes down. But there are lots of social ways to make this number go up. So if the people in front of me are wearing thick glasses and they don't look like they can see very well, that number goes down. If the people in front of me are airline pilots and they're wearing a uniform, then that number goes up. Oh, well, those people must know what they're doing. They're, they're pilots, they have good eyesight. Right. If the people are wearing suits or they're uh, right, they look like they're laboratory technicians. But it also turns out that the answer is culture. Right. America. A lot of psychology was done in America during this period. And they assumed, well, you know, this is psychology. We're studying the human brain. But of course, what they were really studying were Americans. And, and so it turns out that this number is actually low because America is what's called a loose culture. Right. America is one of the most individualistic cultures. People don't like to go along with other people. So in fact, those people who guessed 55 or 60, right, in other countries, this number is, tends to be higher in more what are called tight cultures, cultures that have more rules um, or where rules are more important um, than in the US. So this number is cultural. It depends on who's in the classroom. It depends on what the rules of your society are. But of course, it does depend a little bit on biology, um, that we like to think that students and human beings think alone. The, the skull of the Homo sapien is on the right. The one on the left is actually Neanderthal. Um, they might have been smarter. And so if you think about the skills that we evolved to have, right, 10,000 years ago when we were competing with Neanderthals, we were not the fastest or the tallest or maybe even the smartest creatures on the planet. 
but we were the most cooperative, right? We were, we were designed to work in teams to hunt mammoth, uh, to do, you know, agricultural eventually. And so we are designed to listen to that person who's taller, who looks like they know what they're doing. We cooperate. And if we didn't, if we said, no, nah, I'm going to wander off on my own and I'm going to think for myself, we starve to death. So those people, you didn't get their genes. We got the genes who said, oh, okay, you, you want me to stand over here and, and throw the spear when you, when you yell? Okay. So this is good in some ways, right? It means that we're shallow experts. We can specialize. We can build an iPhone because we don't have to do all of the parts ourselves, right? Other people can do the electronics. We'll do the screen. You do the programming. So we are, we are able to do things as a species because we are cooperative and we are shallow experts. But it also means we have a massive tendency to conform, right? We pay a lot of attention to the height of the person who is speaking to their social standing. Do we want to be in their group? Are they on a sports team that we admire or a group that we like? So it turns out that in class discussion, self-social identification determines who we listen to and even whose data we believe. And of course, I sadly, we are seeing lots of demonstrations of this politically where we think that, well, data will convince people. Remember, we started off with heart attack patients. We think that data will convince people, but actually what matters the most is who is giving me the data. If the person is giving me the data is somebody that I trust, somebody I think, oh, I identify with you, you are in the same social group that I'm in, I'm more likely to listen to your data. So it turns out that who you think you are determines what data you believe, not the other way around, right? But that's because as teachers, right, it works for us. So it turns out that when we're trying to get students to change their mind, we think they're thinking for themselves. And what do you think of this data? Think about this. But in fact, changing your mind means, wait, do I have to change my friends' minds? Will I be ostracized for this view? What I really am thinking about what's most relevant, especially for adolescents, if you're teaching you know, you know, 14 to 25-year-olds, is will I have to change my friends? Right? That the information that we're giving, the, the content that we're providing, students are what they're really processing is, what are my friends going to think about this if I have to change my mind? So how can we have better discussions? So discussion is a good technique, but there are certainly ways to make it better. One of the most important is to do anonymous polls. Uh, and I'll give you some back channel chat, but right, the things I asked you, you know, and these aren't anonymous in Zoom, but doing anonymous polls, um, uh, doing a, like a survey um, or using index cards, right? Having people think about this first. This is of course what juries do and lawyers know this. And it's the same problem of self-social identification. If I'm sitting in the jury room thinking, I think that person is guilty, but the first person who speaks says, oh, that person is not guilty, I begin to doubt myself. And if the person says, oh, not guilty, then I gain in confidence, um, right? So anonymous polls, right down, which, oh, it turns out that half of the people think what I do and half the people don't. That's a much better way to get people to start to realize what they actually think. Preparing opening statements. I'm a big fan of, of index cards, right? I like these little cards that we write on, very low tech. Uh, they're cheap, um, but write down your opening statement. What do you think? Um, and then you know, we reveal or pass it to the person next to you and then write a rebuttal or have a discussion with the person next to you. Discover somebody who thinks a different, find, if you think the answer is 12 to this math problem, find somebody who thinks the answer is 13 and see if you can convince them the answer is 12 or see, work through the problem with a person who got a different answer. But you first do it yourself and then you compare. It also turns out that the kinds of questions that we ask really matter, right? When private beliefs are at stake, people dig in. So it's better to ask people questions instead of what do you think, but how many different explanations can you come with? So in this character, in this book, how many different explanations could you come up with why they did this? Or if you're in a business class, what are the different explanations for how they reached this decision? Not just why do you think they made this decision or what factors do you think they considered, but how many different explanations can you come up with? Volume, right? Quality first, uh, quantity first before quality. Or I sometimes, can you think of both an example and a counterexample, right? The kinds of questions we ask students to consider can also lead to better discussions, right? Since self-social identification matters, 
It also matters if we can build trust as a group. This is one of the reasons that our class discussion often gets better over time as we feel more comfortable. The first day, I'm a little, or what are people going to think of me? I'm not going to say anything, right? So it helps to practice on safe subjects. One of my favorite subjects for American students is where's the best pizza? Right, because they care passionately about this, but it doesn't have the same kind of impact as climate change or something like this. So let's let's practice on a simple uh, subject. Um, let's encourage compliments, explaining the relevance. Wh what subject do we all really care about, and what do we share as a group? Well, we all really care about this topic. Um, let's work to see if we can uncover more about this topic. But remember, the students don't always understand the academic process. So rubrics, um, sometimes meta-analysis, what was the best thing about the discussion that just happened, separating students into two groups sometimes. So you have one group that's giving points to the other group, and then you give them a rule. So give points for the comment that most open a new line of inquiry. Or I make students do things like, uh, in order to speak, you have to start with, what I liked about the previous comment was, and, or, and then maybe students in the outer circle give points to who made a connecting idea. Um, sometimes we structure the discussions. Um, we assign roles, right? An evidence watchdog. So your job today is to make sure that um, you ask, how do you know that? What is the evidence for that? That's your job today. And then your job is to make sure nobody speaks for longer than two minutes. So you give people different jobs um, that can also help with discussions. It also helps to have diverse groups. And again, the internet and Zoom have allowed us to say, well, we're going to, we're going to share our discussion today with some people on the other side of the world. Um, but having diverse groups is not enough because the people who were the represented, right, the one, especially if you don't have enough critical mass, those people tend to not want to speak. That's also true of just divergent thinkers in general, right? We are socialized to not say, hey, I have a crazy idea. And so we learn to be silent. So encouraging outliers is, is an, another important part of discussion. Another way to help your discussions get better is to think of rules of engagement, right? Have the group say first, what are we going to do to make sure, what does a good discussion look like, right? We need to have that, that we don't know. What's a good discussion look like? What does trust look like? Um, so these are just some sample rules. Listen first, um, talk straight, be honest, use simple language. Now, don't try to confuse people with academic language. Um, demonstrate respect, but then you have to unpack what does respect look like, right? What does respect mean to different people in the room? Let's discuss that. Um, hold yourself accountable. This is probably too many. I wouldn't do any more than five, um, but then you post them and you say, these are the rules and then say, so those, remember we were gonna try to do this. So that can also help people um, have, have more difficult discussions. And this is a big one for academics because we have been so trained that you have to have a point of view. You have to have a thesis in your essay. You have to argue for something. Well, the data tells us that when you argue for something, you consider less information and you're less likely to change your mind. You also obviously don't go as deep. So there's a toilet here because the, one of the questions is, do you know how a toilet works? People say, yes, do you know how a ballpoint pen works? Oh, yes, do you know how a computer works? Sure. Well, tell me exactly how a toilet works. How does it work? Explain to me what happens. Oh, maybe I don't know as well as I thought. Maybe I don't really understand. I know I use a computer every day. I use a radio every day, but I don't really know how it works. So getting people to explain how something works. How does this policy work? Not whether you're in favor of it or not. Um, so we often emphasize the thesis, but this is called the illusion of explanatory depth. When we say this is how this works, we often overestimate how well we understand the details. And so getting students to talk about the details, just how does this work before do you support this? Um, I have a question. Um, yeah, I have time for a question. Do you want to unmute and uh, let me see if I can do that. Can you unmute our question, uh, Beatrice? I can, uh, hang on, maybe I have to do this. Uh, there you are, go ahead. Was that raising a question, your hand for a question, Beatrice? Uh, no. Okay, we'll keep going, everyone. We'll, we'll come back for more questions. Um, so the other thing that's required though is motivation, right? Changing your mind is not just, oh, you've given me the right process, you set up the right circumstances. We have to motivate students, right? Effort is required and change is hard as we just saw. 
So I'm going to use the analogy of physical fitness quite a lot today because it's good for academics, because we all know intuitively or intellectually that watching somebody else do push-ups is not very useful. And yet as teachers, we do this all the time. We demonstrate for students and think, right, do it like this. But right, if a fitness coach did this, we'd all say, well, that's not really what makes you a good teacher. It's getting me to do push-ups, right? Watching someone else do push-ups, even if they're intellectual push-ups, is not that useful. The goal, the reason I go to a gym is because somebody is going to get me to do more push-ups. So that means my fitness coach has to be an expert in motivation and getting me to do the effort. So we need to understand a little bit about how motivation works. So human motivation works in three ways, right? The first is that we have a salience detector. Is this relevant and worthwhile to me? Does this have meaning for me? right? When this happens, the emotional feeling is engagement. We feel like this matters. And it turns out this matters a whole lot more than we think it does, right? Even somebody, you know, this example of, of being a lifeguard, right? You're doing an important job. It has purpose. But if I show a lifeguard a video of somebody saving somebody before they go on their shift, they are more, they pay more attention. They are more engaged in their job because they've been reminded of why it matters. So reminding students of why this homework matters is a critical part of this. We are doing this because you want to become a nurse. This is why you need to have this skill. But the more we can continue to connect students to relevance, uh, the more they will pay attention. And I point out that the first word of that English phrase, pay attention, is pay. It costs something. You have lots of other things you can do even before social media. Your brain gets 11 million impulses a second and you can't process most of them. You can process, you know, maybe 40. So you're, you're discarding things all the time. You're ignoring things. The human brain is set up to ignore. That's why our brains are actually so small. We'd need a much bigger brain if we were going to process all of the information, all of the content that you want to provide. So once I have your attention, I want to keep your attention. And so the way that you keep attention is through competency, right? Optimal challenge. So if something is too easy, you quit. If something is too hard, even if it's relevant, you quit. So we have to build in optimism into what we do. We don't want to challenge students too much too quickly. The sequence, how we do it. So competency or what's sometimes called mastery, but really the emotional feeling is optimism. The I believe I can do it is what keeps me focused. And then finally, autonomy, right? Humans like choice. We like self-determination. And so do I have any agency here? Do I get to choose what I'm doing or which problems I work on? So feedback is part of that, but this is, so engagement, optimism, and agency. And what's interesting is that video games have figured this out. This is a face from a video game. This is what's called uh, the epic win face, right? She's about to win big. She's about to get points, right? So she is engaged. She's optimistic. She's about to win and she has agency, right? So this is a video game. And I just noticed video games have a word for this. They call this pleasantly frustrating. In other words, not too, if it's too easy, too pleasant, you quit. If it's too hard, too frustrating you quit. Optimal challenge is pleasantly frustrating. And so video games can adapt to people. So if it's too hard for you, it gets easier, but it's too easy for somebody else. It gets harder for you. So video games are personalized in a way that's very hard to do in a classroom, but they do work. And so we want to design universities to be more like a good video game. So they are engaging, they provide optimism and agency. Another way to, to create motivation is to make the big problem visible, right? Students care about big problems, climate change, poverty, water. So making those things visible and, and connecting this, I know this looks like I'm just doing math today, or I'm just, so math problems are a great example, right? Nobody cares about dividing apples and oranges, right? But they do care about others. You know, what are the things they care about? So I use the example, so instead of trains, right? Nobody cares about trains and train A catching up with train B, but, so the one political party is, is, is signing up voters at 20 per, per minute and the other, or 20 per hour, and the other was planning up at 30 per hour. When does the group A have to start to catch, right? That's actually more motivating. It's the same math problem as train A and train B going 20 and 30 miles an hour. But nobody cares when train A catches up with train B. But I care about when my political party 
signs up more voters than the other political party. So I can change even a math problem to make the big problem visible. And that students are more likely to do those problems because they seem relevant and motivating. Notice that nothing I'm advocating today is about making things easier for people. Like, oh, you're just trying to, you know, give make it easy. It's like, no, actually, if it's easy, right? I have low expectations of students. I just confuse students. If I have low expectations and I have high support, that's not good. So the place where motivation and effort are maximized is when I have both high standards and high care. And we've known this for a long time, going way back to the 50s, uh, that people perform their best when there are high standards and there's lots of compassion and support. So in fact, the secret sauce of education or of motivation is both of these things, right? So I wanna talk a bit more now about some techniques um, for how we can create that motivation and that sense of agency. Um, so again, we're trying to create these three things, engagement, optimism, and agency, which is highly the way that we get students to want to do the work that we want them to do. So transparency turns out to be one of these things, right? What am I supposed to do and why? And part of the problems is that we are teachers, we are faculty, so we're strange, right? We like school so much we never left. We're still here. That's weird, right? Most students want to graduate and go on to do other things and not spend their whole life in school. We like school. Think about the gym, right? Think about when you go to the gym and you see that fitness coach and they've got the muscles and you think, ooh, that person likes the gym too much. They do push-ups just for fun. They like doing push-ups. I, I don't like doing push-ups. I go to the gym because somebody else will force me to do them. So when students look at us, they see, you go to the library because you like it. And that's a little strange. So when we think of college, we think college feels like this. People are smiling. They know how to raise their hand when they have a question. They're engaged, right? We also think that we look like this. We look kind and friendly and we're just explaining stuff. But actually, this is what we look like. Right, We look like an 80s aerobics class. It's like, what is going on? Why are people dressed that way? Who is Richard Simmons and why is he wearing those glasses? Right, Things are just strange Right, because we know how the rules of academia work. We know what an academic discussion looks like, but students don't. And so when you're confused or you're thinking, oh, I might make a fool of myself, I sit back. So again, this happens to everybody. Fitness coaches do it too. We assume we know what, that people understand what's going on in our environment and we have to make it explicit. What are the rules? What does a good discussion, what is discourse? Why do we talk the way that we do in a class? Why do we raise our hands? Why am I dressed this way? Um, why am I still using chalk? All of those sorts of things that seem normal to us, they're not normal to other people. So, Another thing we need to consider is that feedback is highly motivational, right? But the kind of feedback we do matters. So I use this analogy of a tennis net because we all think that to learn tennis, I need a tennis coach, somebody to give me content, right? Move your feet, hold the racket this way, whatever. But in fact, a tennis net's a pretty good teacher. Sometimes I don't need more instruction. I just need more opportunity to practice, to hit more balls. Because the tennis net tells me immediately, oh, the ball went into the net. That's not good. Or the ball went over to the net. That's good. So a tennis net provides feedback that is immediate and non-judgmental. That's the model. So if you want, how is the, what's the best feedback for learning? Immediate and non-judgmental. Right. Did what I do work? Did I get the right answer? Am I, am I making progress, progress, optimism? And again, think of video games. Video games tell me immediately this is working. This is not working. And what are the results if I fail? Start over. You don't actually die. You just it's virtual. Start over. Try again. Right. And if it's too hard, we'll make it easier. So so these are good models for what learning in classrooms look like. So transparency matters. But the other thing that matters is a sense of belonging. And belonging is more than diversity. It's more than equity. It's more than inclusion. It's a sense of being seen, connected, supported, and proud. If I really want discussion to get into the conflict that matters for changing minds, I have to first feel trust. 
I have to first feel connected and supported. And even more, I need to feel proud. I need to feel like my opinion could matter, could change things. So how do we do this? It turns out the data is really strong that demonstrating caring helps students learn. Notice it's, it's a perception. You don't have to actually care. Well, okay, you should actually care. But for, in terms of the research, learning names and pronouns, doing a pre-class survey, maybe doing an introductory video saying, hey, welcome to my class before you come. Things like articulating difficulty actually help. So the next thing we're going to do is hard. I had difficulty with it. Um, that actually makes a difference. You know, those, those things like, well, that shouldn't make a difference, but they do. Uh, personal messages. One of the things about being on Zoom or is I can send you a personal chat. Students actually like that. I can use your name in a, in a discussion. I can encourage persistence, right? Keep going. This one is hard. Sometimes that's information, right? I don't know that problem number six is the hardest problem. So telling me problem number six is hard. If you get stuck, keep, you know, try one of the, try problem number seven and then come back to number six. Um, and when I'm doing the homework, that does two things. One is it tells me to skip problem number six. It's hard, but it also sends the message that, oh, you care. And that actually increases my resilience. My desire to keep going increases when I think that you really care, right? So these are all ways to demonstrate caring. But the most important one is your e-communication policy. So most institutions require us to have some sort of office hours or ability for students to contact us. But now that we live in this digital aid, mo most of that is going to be right email or electronic. So the question is, how do we do it? And you all know, I mean, all of us, the students today are very different, right? A lot of us don't do Instagram or TikTok or the various things that happen in your country. Um, so students don't know that they shouldn't just send you a Facebook chat that says, hey, professor, right? So what is the best way to contact you, right? Email is famously for old people. Irony, Facebook is now for old people too. Do you do text? So what do you, what electronic communication do you do? And then how fast do you respond, right? If you don't do weekends, that's okay, but your bank is open 24 seven. So tell me, you know, I do email in the morning. So here is when I'm online, this is the best time to get me. Students like that information. Um, also, uh, you know, how do I get an appointment? Or even, you know, how do I, how do I talk to you? Do I say, hey, do I have to use first name? Do I use last name? Can I friend you on Facebook? Um, these are these are information things that students you know tell me what how do I contact you? But ultimately, what you're doing is issuing an invitation. You're not just saying you know this here's my office, come see me. Why would I go to your office, right? Tone really matters here, right? Um, how do I refer to you? But also, what are offices for? I, it turns out that students actually don't know, so. Give me an example. What's an example of why would I go to office hours? Why would I contact you? Um, what are those conditions? I'm having trouble with the problem. I don't know what topic to write for my paper. Um, but these are the sorts of things that, again, we assume because we live in academia, we live in the classroom, we feel comfortable here. Students don't always know what are office hours for. So the more transparency here, the more sense of belonging we can create, the more likely students are to actually make use of this. And then the next category is scaffolding, right? Uh, which is how do we sequence the learning? How do, how do we get people to actually reflect? I mentioned that reflection is my third R. So the most important piece of scaffolding, I think, is that we create time for reflection. But scaffolding can also be something like a checklist, right? How do I do this assignment? What do I do first? What do I do second? You know, we often say to students, well, write a three to five page paper or, you know, do the odd numbered problems for Tuesday. It's like, well, okay, what do I do first? Well, do you read the chapter? Should you highlight first? Well, highlighting is actually a bad practice. It's better to explain it to your roommate or your mother uh, or some other kind of technique. Um, so we need to be explicit. It also turns out that study skills courses, courses that teach these are study skills, those are too generic because the way that I study for math and the way that I study for music are so different that I need to have specifics. So one of the ways to give students specifics is to give them a, a, a template. And so I, this is on that, that, that website, there's the, the web link there, I'll put it in the chat in a minute, um, is, is to, uh, to give students this template, I'll actually go, I will, I can actually go find it. 
Um, here it is. Again, there are the there are the templates. I put it into chat. Um, so it starts with I give students a uh, here. You take a minute to ask. You know what what grade do you want? How important is this class? How many hours of study do you think this is going to need per week? And then the most important part: choose strategies. What are you going to? So you think that you need three hours a week to study for my class? Great. What are you going to do? Are you going to read the book? Are you going to reread the book? Are you going to do the problems? Are you going to work by yourself? Are you going to work in a group? Will you work with the pets nearby? You're going to have the radio on. So notice I've put little pluses and minuses here. That's a subtle indication of the minuses are actually not very good study techniques. And the pluses are really good study techniques, right? Doing the harder problems, working on extra problems, right? Testing yourself. Those are really good things to do during your two hours a week. Um, Rereading your class notes, probably less useful, right? Maybe reorganizing your class notes or rewriting key concepts in your own words. I've given you a short list here. But you're going to customize this list for students. You're going to say, right, practice by yourself. Practice your lyrics if you're doing music. You're not going to do that in a physics course. So you're going to give techniques. Maybe start on your paper early. Have a roommate or a friend read your paper the night before. Right? What is the timing? When do I start the work? When do I do I have to? Can I do it all in one setting? That's a big one, right? Students think I need two hours. Can I do it all at once? And the answer sometimes is no. You should do your research here. You should write your draft. Then you should sleep on it and then come back to your paper the next day. So students don't know those things. And they're often specific for your class. And then here's the big one, implementation, right? You need two hours a week, four hours a week. When are you going to do it? So this is called the implementation effect. And it comes from research on getting people to quit smoking or vote more or floss or you know, brush their teeth more. If it turns out I say to you, are you going to vote next week? That, that does have a little help. But if I say to you, how are you going to vote? How are you going to get to the voting pl place? That dramatically has a ninefold increase on who votes. Because now my brain is going, well, when am I going to do this? So take out your phone, put in some hours when you set up a reminder that you're supposed to be studying now. And then a week later, I asked how it went. And again, I don't ever see these. It's just a five minute exercise that I do in class that allows students to say, reflect on what you did and then do it better the next time. I do the same sorts of thing. I have a template called a cognitive wrapper for when I hand back a grade and I say, well, before I give you the grade, look at the math problem set, look at the paper, look at my feedback. Remember the tennis net, look at the feedback and estimate where you think you lost points. And then do this little thing. It says, well, I think I lost points here. What would you do differently next time? It gives students a chance to reflect. And then I show them the grade you know, online five minutes later. I mentioned back channels. I've posted one. Uh, so uh, I, I'm using uh, the Go Soapbox is the one I put in the, in the chat. But there are lots of these. Notice they do a lot of things that we used to do on Zoom, right? So as you go back to face-to-face, -face, notice that one of the things that students really want post-COVID is the opportunity to talk to faculty privately without having to raise their hand in class. You may not want to do all of these things, right? Students also want lectures that are videotaped, but the but one that you can give them is the back channel. And so again, there's a, uh, on, my, uh, on my website, there's a little, in fact, I'm gonna give you the, uh, the link here. Um, this is a link, so I have even more back channels and reviews about back channels. But I would, if you, as you go back to face-to-face, -to -face, giving students a way to do surveys, right? Anonymous surveys or polls, a way to ask you questions in the chat, um, which you can do on Zoom, but there are also ways to do it using a back channel. And so uh, that's one. Uh, in fact, if you go to the back channel that I've given you today, um, there's, there's a, you can do a, in fact, let's, I have a minute, let's go ahead and uh, I will give you this. Um, it is. So there's there's today's back channel, and I'll actually um, I'll actually show you how this works. Um, so when I go to um, this back channel, I gotta share my screen with that. Uh, here it is. So this is what I see, 
right? Notice I have this, I love this little confusion barometer. So if you're confused, right, the student clicks confused and I can see that goes red and I, oh, I have, an, I can see I have a confusion barometer. When I'm in a face-to-face -face class, I often have a student monitor this and say, oh, professor, lots of students are confused by that. And they've, got, they've told me that because they can use their phones to do this. Um, I said, there's a poll. So if you go to the poll that says how most important change, uh, if you wanna go ahead and do that, but you can see that the, there are the results of people putting things in. So um, this is, I think a very useful tool. It's something that, that students um, say they like. And so I, I highly encourage um, that continuing that what's really a, a, a practice that we learned in Zoom. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna say is that if you want students to be able to change to be uh, intellectually ambitious, you need to model that, right? Teaching change and teaching thinking means that you can't just know right answers. Because if a student says, professor, what's the answer? And you say, here's the answer. You're confusing them about what it means to be smart, right? Students think that a, that a smart phone, right? We call it a smart phone and they think this is smart, but this isn't smart. Smart is the ability to change your mind. And if we want students to, to think, oh, I'm in school to learn how to change my mind, then I have to model for them what ambiguity is. I have to model intellectual humility that, hmm, I have to think more about that, right? What I call slow thinking. So when a student asks a question, I often say, you know, I don't know. I'll have to think more about that. That's a good question. I'll email everybody later. I'll put it in our chat. I'll put it in our other, we have other channels, right? So I have to demonstrate to students that smart people, the people that we want graduates to be, they're slow thinkers. I have to demonstrate my own failure. And if I really want to help students change, I need to say, you know, that's such a great question. You may have changed my mind. I have to show them that smart people change their mind because they've all the adults they've seen, probably they may never, they may have never seen an adult say, I was wrong, I'm gonna change my mind, right? That's political suicide today. You don't, can't do that, right? Certainly not in America. So tech thinking is more important than it ever was because of the economy, the way the world is changing, the way knowledge is being created more quickly. Change is important. We have to help students learn to think and to change. That means that design has become more important, right? How we design the environment, not just our content. It also means that integration is more important, right? Do we integrate the various things in various different classes? So my model for you is that we think of faculty as professors, right? As a content, think of the word profess, right? We profess, we have content, we give students content. You are always gonna be a creator and a researcher of content. This is a good thing. Content is important, facts do matter. But how we think about them and understanding that not everybody gets facts the same way also really matters. So part of what you also have to do as a teacher is you're a designer. You're designing the environment, right? You're curating materials. You're a role model. And you're ultimately trying to motivate students to do the push-ups because only the person who does the push-ups and does the work changes and gets the benefit. So I often think of this as we should think of our job as being cognitive coaches, right? Our job is to coach people to be thinkers themselves. In some ways you could think of teaching as we want to make ourselves obsolete, right? Not as a profession, but individually, I don't want students to have to come back to me forever and say, what do I do? How do I do? Do I have, can you do some more of those push-ups for me? Is this true? I don't want students to come back to me and saying, professor, is this true? I want you to be able to say to me, I want to say, do you, you should know if this is true. You should be able to figure out for yourself if these facts are true, if this data is relevant, if this is the problem that you want to solve. That's, that should be the standard for graduation, right? We, we often award graduation based upon how much time you sat in class, right? We're given the degree to the wrong part of the body, right? <laughs> how much time you sat on your tush rather than, can you hold two ideas in your head at the same time and think for yourself? And so we should think of ourselves as cognitive coaches. We should model change. And ultimately, that is the job that I want us to do.